The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. Today we're talking with Alex Payne. He is the author of Rest, Why You Can Get More Done When You Work Less. Alex founded The Restful Company to help people and organizations apply these insights. He has a PhD in the History and Sociology of Science from the University of Pennsylvania and is a visiting scholar at Stanford University. Alex, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Rebecca. It's good to be with you. What, What inspired you to write this book? Well, yeah, I think the the simple answer is that it is a challenge to of our prevailing assumptions about the nature of work and the relationship between work and rest. You know, we live in a world in which um, you know overwork has gone from an occupational hazard to a kind of global health crisis. But at, this, at exactly the same time that we have learned. Um, in neuroscience and psychology an awful lot about why rest is important for our long-term health, um, for productivity, and for creativity. And so I th- it, se- it seemed like a good time um, to, or put, uh, to try to summarize this research and make the case that the way that um, we have learned to work in the last couple decades ha- actually doesn't really work well for us and that we have an opportunity to do things differently. Well, you know, I, I definitely agree on with you on that. I mean, um, I, I'm self-employed, so I can make my own hours, but um, it, and I choose not to work long hours, um, mm-hmm. mainly because I I don't want to to hurt myself, and I know the the long-term repercussions of overwork. But in the in North America, and especially in the city where I am. A lot of the time in companies, it's expected that you will work longer hours and you will make those sacrifices for the company. Even if you're on salary and you don't get extra for it, that's what you're expected to do. And and that it's just like the norm. It's just, yeah, this is what I do instead of recognizing how, what that's doing to people and their families as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, we've, I think in you know, the last probably 30 or so years, we've seen a really dramatic increase in expectations around sort of working hours, around sort of people, you know, not taking vacation days, um, making themselves available constantly, thanks to the internet and or smartphones, um, to their employers or to clients. And I think, you know, when you saw the rise of things like the high tech industry and the and or the financial services, where it looked like people had sort of pioneered a model in which you put in Herculean hours and you were rewarded with you know or of, uh, with great success very quickly, it looked like. This was the you know this was now the way in which success happens. You know you don't sort of climb slowly up the ladder and or you know and or get your turn, um, but rather you know you work incredibly hard and you 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 become successful kind of before your technical skills and your capacity to work um, like that burn out. And so this is you know, created a, a, a kind of culture in which we are uh, we have a set of expectations that say that if you are not if you're not putting in long hours, you know, if you're not visible in the office, if you're not kind of performing busyness, 
right? Always looking like you are sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, overscheduled and overstressed, then you're doing it wrong. And I think that there, and it turns out though, that there is a century's worth of research that shows that this is actually a counterproductive way of working and that there are, you know, and that taking a more measured approach to sort of how we, to how we work um, to, uh, is actually better for us both in the long term in, in the sense of allowing us to have better developed careers that, uh, that last longer, but also better in the short term, in terms of our sort of everyday productivity and our ability to be, you know, to be resilient, to deal with the, sort of with um, workplace stresses, and also to do better work, to be more creative, to be more responsive and more flexible. So, you know, for all of those reasons, I think that sort of the, the assumption that, over, that you know, overwork is the key to success and the key to doing great work um, turns out to be uh, sort of uh, actually almost completely backwards. So I, I don't think um, anybody needs an explanation of what overwork is, but I know a lot of people right. feel when you talk about rest and, and relaxing and, and taking that time, there is actually a resistance with a lot of people to, mm-hmm. you, you know, oh, well, I, you know, I want to do things with purpose and I want to always be um, busy and doing things. So what, when, you, when we're talking about rest, what do you mean by that? Right. Well, you know, in its very simplest, rest is the time that you spend recovering the mental and physical energy that you spend working. Now, you know, and we do often have a sense of rest as essentially kind of idle time. You know, it's something that you do um, sitting on a couch with a remote and some salty snacks. And you know, in point, but you know, in point of fact, often the most beneficial restorative kinds of rest are rather different. Um, they are, for example, active uh, rather than passive. They can be physically challenging. They can be sometimes mentally challenging. This is why some people find doing stuff like, um, you know, why people sort of train for, you know, sort of tr- marathons in their free time or become serious craftspeople or painters. Um, but it's also the case that we think of work and rest more as competitors, right? That we live in a kind of zero, zero sum day in which the more time we spend resting, the less time we have for work, the less time we have for productive activities. But in fact, the kind of rest that I talk about in the book um, is not a competitor to work, but rather a partner to it. Not only does it restore our ability to work well when we have to, but it also actually gives our minds the time to explore ideas, to work on problems that have eluded our conscious efforts at at solution, and to provide provide time for coming up with new ideas or insights or solutions to problems that we haven't been able to or figure out through or through or focused application. And so for all, and so that kind of rest is really pretty different from, um, from rest that is, that is more like of um, diversion or distraction. And I think that, you know, this is, this, this, and one of the things that is useful for us to do is to take a different, different kind of approach to rest and to understand that it's not simply, um, you know, it's not simply a passive activity and it's not one that has to be a competitor to work, um, but rather can be its partner. So um, when, when you're, you're talking about this, you, you touch on this in your book, and, and I, I found it interesting to, to read that because it um, is definitely something that, that works for me when you're really busy. Um, you, you talked about a, a lot of people being very busy, and then they would take a break, and then uh, suddenly 
things would resolve in their head, the problem they couldn't solve or that kind of thing, which mm-hmm. I, I think is that, you know, I've had that happen uh, obviously many times. I think most people can relate to that where you just have to let it go for a bit. So mm-hmm. so h- how is that, that working for us? I mean, most people would think that you sit there and you work and you solve the problem and then you're done. Why is right. taking that break making that difference for us? Well, being, what you're what you're describing is you know a phenomenon that everybody that you know everybody is familiar with. The very simple version of it is you know, sort of trying to remember you know who that actor was who was in that movie who was also in that other thing, and you can't remember their name. But five minutes later, you're doing something else, and all of a sudden, the answer pops into your head. Well, what's going on there is that. We don't just solve problems by consciously working on them. Our subconscious minds are also capable of taking up problems and often attacking them from somewhat different kinds of angles um, with a greater degree of creativity than we can bring to bear um, or through conscious effort. And And so what happens is that when we allow ourselves time to essentially let our minds wander. Very often what they will do is go back, you know, uh, go back to these unsolved problems, um, the challenges that we're facing, and we'll turn them over and sort of work on them without our consciously being aware of them. And, and sometimes we'll come up with an answer. Now, it turns out that this, is a, this, is, you know, this isn't something that is just random and inherently mysterious. Scientists have been spending a lot of time in the last 20 or so years trying to understand how this works, what the mechanisms are, and it turns out that, you know, first of all, that there is a set of sort of connections in the brain that activate when we relax our minds that seem tuned to working on of, uh, of creative solutions to problems. But second, that this is the, the set of connections, what they call the default mode network, actually is something that we can train to, or, uh, to, to, get, to get better, to get stronger. Um, you, can, you can actually see it in children who have a lot of free time to play. Their default mode networks activate more quickly and they're more complicated than those of children who don't have a lot of free time. And so what it and it turns out that some of history's most creative and prolific people, you know, people like Nobel Prize winning scientists or famous artists or writers, work in a lot of free time, a lot of leisure time in their days, precisely so that they can have periods where they're allowing their subconscious minds to work on these problems. And so it turns out that this kind of rest is actually something that we can learn to get better at. You know, in addition to being a partner to work, in addition to being something that's active, this sort of rest is also kind of a skill. It's, it's something that we all know how to do naturally, but it's also something that we can all get better at, you know, much in the way that if you are an athlete or a, or a singer, um, you learn to use your breathing to help you maintain a steady pace or to project your voice. And so, but... Yeah, that's, uh, but what they're doing is making use of a creative ability, just like the physical ability of breathing, that we all possess, but which we can sort of learn to cultivate and put to, or, uh, put to better use in both our personal lives and in our working lives. So, um, if this is so important, why are we pushing ourselves not to do this anymore? Why? What, what's happened where we're just ignoring that basic need for ourselves and working these long hours and, and not doing this? Right. You know, I think that, um, you know, we've had this, I mean, part of it is that... Uh, Part of the answer is cultural and sort of economic, that, you know, we are called upon to work ever longer hours in an increasingly competitive global economy um, by by companies that very often um, believe themselves capable of 
relocating their you know operations to sort of other cities or other countries if they don't have a sufficiently sort of pliable or compliant workforce. But it's also the case that we do a really good job of internalizing um, these uh, these expectations ourselves. You know, that um, sort of we come to see. Uh, you know, we see other people working this way, and so it becomes kind of natural for us to or to, uh, to work this way ourselves. Um, we also don't want to let down other people, you know, let down sort of colleagues who are you know who are working hard on you know uh, hard on projects and putting in long hours. We want to be like them, and we also you know, and it is also the case that you know, when you are. When you're young, you're in a new industry, there is a learning curve, and it is, and there are times when putting in extra hours can teach you things about the nature of your craft or your industry that you don't learn just in a regular nine to five. Um, But it's the case, you know, but that, but the assumption that that kind of uh, overwork is sustainable over the long term is the problem. You know, sort of what we find, what scientists have found in studies ranging from factory workers to law enforcement to physicians, is that you can sustain periods of overwork for a few weeks at a time. Okay, sort of like seasonal work, right? You gotta get the harvest in. Um, but after about, you know, about four, four to six weeks, what happens is that you're, or if you begin to get tired, your productivity goes down, and what organizations see is a decline in productivity such that um, you're actually getting less done after several months of overwork than you would be if you were just working 40 hours a week, doing a, or doing a normal week. However, it's the case you know, in... This is, some, this is something that's easy to miss because we naturally assume that, you know, the more hours you work, the more you're going to get done. Um, but if you have more on your plate, the way to or deal with, uh, to get, to clear those things is to put in more time rather than less. Um, and it's also, and, you know, and finally, in things like creative industries or, you know, basically, an industry in which you don't have like a bucket of things sort of at the end of every day, or you know, uh, you know material things that you've that you've produced. It's often the case that it's kind of tricky to measure how productive you've been and how effective you've been, and so it feels like the number of hours that you've put in is a, is as good a measure as any for of, uh, for your productivity and your commitment. Um, unfortunately, though, it turns out that's not the case. Um, you know, I I find this uh, fascinating, I, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a quick break and pick this up. Um, we're talking today with Alex Payne, and he's the author of Rest: Why You Get More Done When You Work Less. And we'll be back shortly. <music> Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. The largest syndicated alternative health talk program has come to the Voice America Network. The Dr. Bob Martin Show is the program that will answer your health questions and help you to heal your own body of many different ailments. Each week, you'll hear the answers that Dr. Bob gives to his callers that help them to be their own doctor most of the time. We'll also discuss developments on the health care front and what you need to do to keep your body in top form. The Dr. Bob Martin Show airs Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480 294 6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. 
Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417. Or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Alex Pang. He's the author of Rest. Why You Get More Done When You Work Less. Now, Alex, in your book, you talk about um, four hours. What does that mean? So when you look at the daily schedules of some of history's most creative and prolific people, one of the things you find is this paradox, which is that these are people who were incredibly ambitious. They were often working in very competitive fields. And yet they only labored doing stuff that, you know, we would regard as work for about four or maybe five hours a day. And these are people like, you know, Stephen King, who's written more books, you know, who's written a sort of shelf full of of novels, or um, Charles Dickens, or Charles Darwin. And what it turns out is that they not only, they work in very consistent kinds of ways, um, but they also rest in very consistent ways as well. And this helps explain their, their sort of creativity and their productivity. So, um, these, uh, and what happens is that they work for, uh, in very intensive bursts, um, for about, uh, sort of periods of about two hours with a little break and then another two hours. And very often by that point, they're done with the important work of the day. They then go out. And we'll do things like go on very long walks or hikes or, or uh, do other uh, other kinds of things that are diverting, that are not too terribly um, sort of cognitively challenging. And they'll have more interesting ideas out there, you know, or of ideas for or of plot lines or you know or, or or turns of phrase or how to end a chapter. And they and what it seems is that they are, they're doing a couple things. I mean, one is that by layering these periods of really intensive work and then rest, they're able to kind of create a sort of momentum that allows their creative subconscious to continue working on these problems even while they're out you know, enjoying a, enjoying a walk or sort of doing something else that's, uh, that's pleasant. But also, they're following a, st- uh, a kind of style of working that it turns out is one that um, music students, that professional athletes also follow, which is one in, in which they discover that these periods of intense focused work allow them to dive deeper into a problem and to get more done than if they spent long, you know, sort of longer periods of time um, grinding away at a problem, you know, maybe sort of multitasking the way that, uh, that so many of us feel compelled to. And, um, but it turns out getting less done. Now, not all of us are able you know, have the freedom to or f- to uh, to compress our days down into four hours, and you know, people like Charles Darwin are. You know, I think of them almost as like Usain Bolt or Serena Williams, right? They're they are world class at managing work and rest. But I think that there are still lessons that we can learn from their lives that we can apply to our own about how we manage work, about how we manage rest and how we take and how we can learn to take both seriously and to do both of them better. 
So um, earlier in the show, uh, before the break, you, you spoke about um, things that were sort of a, a diversion or distraction versus uh, rest. So what's the difference between those two? So um, the, difference main, the difference is in how our minds react to them. So things like social media, for example, are a diversion, but they're not as restful as you would think because our brains treat them almost almost more like work than like entertainment. Um, now, I think that, you know, for people, uh, of course, everybody is a little bit different. And so what, you know, what you're going to find restful is something that you've got to figure out for yourself. But generally, um, the things that are most restorative that offer the, um, the biggest psychological benefits are things that are that have some physical component um, that are allow for some psychological what they call detachment, which is basically getting your mind off work or not having to think about anything in particular. And those are the things that allow you to recharge fastest and also give your mind a chance to continue working on problems that you know, that uh, that have uh, that have been on your mind um, and to explore possible solutions. So, and then, so um, that kind of, uh, that kind of rest turns out to be sort of more useful to you and sort of healthier than, um, than many of the kinds of things that we, that we often think of as restful or entertaining. So, um, in your book, you give uh, examples of things that are versions that um, can help people find rest. Um, one mm-hmm. of them you've mentioned a few times is, is walking, and then you you also talk about naps. And I, I you know, they, um, there's a bit of a, a faux pas, I think, around even wanting to have a nap. But what does that do for us if we were to be able to do that in our day? All right. Well, you know, naps, it turns out, are not just for, you know, four-year-olds on those yoga mats, but um, it's something that, uh, or, uh, that, you know, until fairly recently um, was a part of the work days of, of many of us, whether we were, you know, working in um, factories or in fields or, or in offices. And it turns out that the benefits of naps are, are number one, that humans for a very long time didn't sleep in a continuous or of, you know, in eight continuous hours sort of all night. Um, it was much more common historically for us to break up our sleep into a couple different periods in the night and the day. And so in that sense, there, it looks like there is a little more naturalness to breaking up the day with a, sort of with a nap than sort of trying to just power through the whole day. But another benefit is that naps are surprisingly restorative psychologically and sort of mentally. So even a 20-minute nap can be as restorative for your energy and your attention as you know going out for another cup of coffee. And um, there are even people who learned to kind of train themselves to um, remember their dreams when they were napping and to, or you know, to wake themselves up very quickly so that they would start to fall asleep. They'd have, you know, sort of in that boundary between wakefulness and sleep have some useful idea and they would sort of, you know, they would make a note of it, write it down, and then drift off to sleep for, you know, sort of, uh, and, uh, and sort of rest. Um, you know, and even 20 minutes, it turns out, can be really, um, can be really good for you. So that's why, you know, that's why, that's why naps turn out to be a really valuable thing. Well, in, in that same line of thought, not just napping, but um, sleeping, you talk about as well, and, you know, how sleep deprivation affects us. And, you know, there there's this um, stigma in our society, I think, that goes along with the overwork of, you know, I don't need a lot of sleep, and I don't need to, to do this, and I can push myself through, through this. And, and what does that do to us when, when we, you know, don't sleep enough, and, and mm-hmm. uh, we're feeling those effects? Um, in the short run, 
sleep deprivation is associated with higher levels of errors at work, um, with sort of ethical sort of uh, missteps, even with cheating. And so that's, you know, that's, that's just in the short run. In the long run, people who are chronically sleep deprived and overworked have higher levels of you know, burnout of or sort of stress related diseases, even higher levels of um, sort of dementias, because it turns out that when we sleep, our brains are actually doing critical kind of maintenance work where they're clearing out toxins and sort of um, doing sort of literally doing physical work on the brain to sort of maintain its health. And so when you sleep less, your brain has less time to do that work. And over the long run, um, that, you know, that sort of, that has a measurable impact on our health. So the idea that, you know, you can, that you get by on four or five hours of sleep a night is something that may be true in the very short run, but over the long run, um, it's going to be something for which you're likely to pay a, pay a higher price than you realize. So um, what you mentioned, uh, burnout. So what does that look like when we're, we're headed in that direction? What, how does that affect us? And what, are we, what well, should we look out for? Well, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of things. And one of them is... Um, simple physical exhaustion. You have a harder time, or you know, or of getting th- getting through the day. Um, you often paradoxically have a harder time getting to sleep. I think we've all had that, you know, experience of being too tired to too tired to get to sleep. Um, if that's something that's you know that happens repeatedly, then that's one symptom. Another is um, kind of psychological disengagement from work that you know, even a job that you used to really like um, becomes one that it becomes harder and harder to feel enthusiastic about. And this is a real problem for you know, employers because very, you know, in um, service industries or you know, professions, it's all, uh, people, people often um, really do give their best when they are at their best. And so that kind of disengagement is something that uh, that can have a notable noticeable effect on productivity and ability to perform. You know, another thing is uh, you know I think that uh, is a tendency or or of a risk of um, cutting corners. And this is something that, you know, is a pro- that obviously is a problem if you are, you know, let's say a doctor or a lawyer. But even in big organizations, um, this, is, this can be a serious challenge. Uh, you, you remember last year there was the case of Samsung with the exploding smartphones, the Galaxy yeah. 7. You know, yeah. it turned out. You know, you know when they sort of when they looked at uh, looked at what happened, um, it turned out that you know they had worked enormously hard in order to push that phone out before Apple had uh, had time to get out the iPhone Seven. This was going to give Samsung a de- you know a decisive edge in the market, and so you had engineers working insane hours, sleeping under their desks. And in the course of that, it turned out, you know, obviously they got really, uh, really fatigued and they, and that was what was responsible for missing the really subtle indicators that there was a problem with the battery under certain circumstances. Now, this was something that maybe they could have caught if they had been, you know, if the, if the engineers had been better rested and better able to see this little problem. Um, but, you know, when you're making a product that you're going to, or if, you know, that's incredibly complicated that you're going to make in units of like, you know, hundreds of millions, even if you have a one in a million you know, chance of something going wrong with it, you can have hundreds of examples, you, know, you know, hundreds of cases of this thing literally blowing up on you and you're creating 
it turns out billions of dollars worth of damage for your, you know, for your company and and its reputation. And so, you know, this I think in today's high tech world where we have, you know, smarter and smarter and more and more complex products, um, the problems of overwork and the costs become ones that are that are getting harder and harder for companies to justify and to bear. Um, you know, I, I I definitely agree with you on that. It, it's 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 a hard balance for sure because we're competing and pushing ourselves so much, but it's affecting our work, it's affecting our families, and it's affecting us to to continue down this path. And it it seems if we keep pushing, we're going to end up like the Samsung, and we're going to explode. <laughs> That's a good, good example you gave there. Um, we are going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Alex Payne. He's the author of Rest, Why You Get More Done When You Work Less. We'll be back shortly. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. Take us on the go. It's even easier now. The Voice America Talk Radio Network has launched our mobile app for iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry. Visit the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market to download the app powered by Aircast. It's free and no registration is necessary. In minutes, you could be enjoying your favorite Voice America Talk Radio host, no matter where you are, in the car, out and about, while traveling, or anytime you can't be close to your computer. Catch up on the archives you've missed or discover new shows on the spot. Search Voice America at your favorite app store. What causes us to be sick? We're not talking about the actual illness or the scientific cause of illnesses. We're talking about your body and health. Listen for the healing whisper of return to peace. Each week, host Dr. Marianne Chase shows you how to listen to your heart to identify poor health, stress, and disease. You'll learn how to heal energetically and spiritually as well as physically. It's time to depend less on the drugs and more on the heart. The Healing Whisper airs live every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. Follow the Voice America Talk Radio Network on Twitter. We're at Voice America TRN. You'll get the latest fix on what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and general happenings that you should know about at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Now you don't have to miss anything when you're away from your home or office. Just go to twitter.com forward slash Voice America TRN or follow along with us at Voice America TRN, the Voice America Talk Radio Network. We're on the cutting edge of social media. Can you keep up? Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Alex Payne. He's the author of Rest, Why You Get More Done When You Work Less. So, Alex, we, we, we talked about all, all of the benefits of taking rest. And um, the problem is that I think people listening are probably going, well, you know what? I've got a job that has high demand, and I, I need that to support my family. And then I've got kids who need me to drive them to soccer and, and run around and do this, this, and this, and this. And so the time for myself doesn't exist so how can people um, incorporate this so that they don't experience that burnout that we talk about and so that they can actually find that balance right well you know I think the first thing is to take rest seriously and to recognize that you know or if if you take the you know if you assume that um, rest is something that you'll get after you get everything else done you'll never get any rest because you know let's because you know we never finish everything these days, um, but I think that you know as a practical matter, um, for, for what we see with um, or if people like or if, uh, or if, uh, physicians who have 
longer, healthier careers is that um, they are much better at doing things like taking vacations regularly, at sort of detaching when they are um, not at work than people uh, sort of who burn out. Um, I think it's really, you know, it's really easy both to underestimate the virtues or the benefits of taking weekends to yourself, of sort of turning off your phone, you know, not checking sort of work email late at night, and of taking all your vacation days. You know, Americans in particular are just notoriously bad at this. We leave you know, tens of billions of dollars worth of vacation time you know, on the table every year. And even, you know, even just taking all of those would be or would uh, would provide significant health benefits. But we also underestimate just how much damage we do to ourselves by doing things like checking email at night or checking in over the weekend. Um, we get an awful lot of benefit from being able to put work out of our minds for even just, you know, overnight. And so I think that recognizing those benefits and sort of recognizing that it is important, both in the short term and the long term, to take that kind of time for ourselves and to recognize that even in a world that is constantly trying to soak up as much of our time and attention as possible, that we do still have some ability to make choices about how we're going to spend our time and sort of how we're going to rest is you know, essential to staying sane and staying balanced and staying productive. So, um, you know, what, what would be a, an ideal vacation? I mean, you mentioned it and um, I know it means sometimes it, it can be not cost effective for people. It's hard for them to go away on a big vacation. Mm-hmm. But what, what, what could that look like just so that people are getting that, that healthy balance? Sure. Well, you know, I think first off, the only bad vacation is the vacation that you don't take. Um, so, yeah, but um, if you look at how long a vacation, how many, how long a vacation um, provides sort of maximum benefit, you find that people that people's kind of pleasure levels on vacation tend to peak after about one week and then stay about the same. And the, and the psychological benefits of vacations in terms of greater happiness, resilience at work, last about two months. So in an ideal world, if you're able to get away for a few days every few months, then that's terrific. Now, not everyone, of course, is able to do that, but um, the closer you can get to that, the more likely you are to be able to have kind of sustained benefits over the course of the year. But it's also the case that doing super fancy, complicated things or, you know, very expensive ones doesn't necessarily buy you an awful lot more of restorative time or rest than um, simpler vacations. You know, it often, in fact, creates an expectation that Everything has to be perfect that you have to, you know, you have to do as much on your vacation as you do on the job. And so, you know, paradox, and that can, you know, that can create that situation where, you know, you try to do a thousand things and you come back and you feel like you need a vacation to recover from your vacation. So, you know, it turns out that, uh, that, um, you know, that simpler vacations, often slightly shorter ones are sort of better for us than, you know, super long, super elaborate ones. But, you know, ultimately, like I said, you know, the only really bad vacation is the one that you don't take. So, um, yeah, like you said, it might not be possible for people to go away, you know, every couple of months for a few days. And in, in North America, no. an average person gets two weeks off unless they're higher up in their totem pole. So how can exactly. we find how can we find that balance without being able to take vacations? Is there something we can do that just can reset us, you know, um, without being able to do that? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I think... Um, First off, like I said, that uh, you know that that taking 
taking rest more seriously on an everyday basis and a kind of weekly basis is the first really significant thing that, uh, that we can do. And, um, you know, there have been some very interesting experiments that show that we tend to overestimate how important it is for us to stay connected to the office. Um, that, you know, uh, or there was a wonderful study, for example, of a consulting company in Boston that allowed people to um, detach one night a week. And not only were people healthier and happier, but it turned out the clients who everyone assumed would, you know, or if, uh, would get mad that they weren't getting their emails returned instantaneously, never noticed that the experiment was going on. So, I mean, being a, so, you know, uh, or taking that time for detachment is an important thing. I th- the other really valuable thing is having a serious hobby. Something, you know, particularly for people who are in high pressure jobs, jobs that are actually difficult to put out of your mind. Um, having something that is not just diverting, but really kind of psychologically engaging for you is amazingly valuable because what that does is makes it easier for you to uh, to, to take mental time off from work. Um, puts you in that state where you're less tempted to check your email, to check your phone, and gives you a kind of, or of a, a creative outlet, an outlet for your, or of, for your energy that turns out to be really psychologically valuable. So having a serious hobby um, is actually the other great thing that you can do if you don't have large amounts of leisure time or a lot of control over your, over your own schedule. So you've mentioned creativity a few times, um, and mm-hmm. and what what does that do for us? To what does that do to be creative? Oh, that's, well, you know, I mean, I think that um, the that's a that's a great question, and the answer <laughs> is that you know we often think of creativity as something that like you know just artists and writers exhibit, but everybody is creative. Um, this is something that all humans are able to do, and one of the but you know one of the benefits of being able to exercise that creativity is that it is it, it allows us it often allows us a degree of psychological autonomy and and uh, or of and control that sometimes in our daily lives or our or of our, our working lives is lacking you know if you and that's really beneficial if you look at young children for example you know children children can be incredibly imaginative and incredibly creative and that's a great thing in part because they don't have a lot of control over their own lives right you have someone else telling them what to eat when to sleep when to take a nap even if they don't want to and so the ability to escape into an imaginary world or to build an imaginary world is for kids really terrific. But it's also the case that adults uh, uh, take exactly the same kind of benefit for the same reasons. And so, you know, even if you don't see yourself as being in a job or a profession that, you know, call, that, you know, demands a high level of creativity, or even if you don't see yourself as a creative person, you know, in reality, you know, the reality is, all humans are creative, and we're all better off when we have the opportunity, when we take the time for ourselves to exercise that. Well, you know, I, I think a good example of this is when I was in school and studying, my poor little brain was hurting. And, <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm not um, particularly artistic, but I did start to, to draw and paint at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I think it was more, it was probably what we're talking about that I really needed, something that was very different from what I was doing, you know, <laughs> 12 or more hours a day is studying and being right. in school and using that part of my brain and I would just suddenly need that something different and and then I was able to to concentrate better so I I, I would say that's what I was doing <laughs> without mm-hmm. understanding Absolutely. it yeah. yeah so yeah. go ahead 
Oh, you know, but okay. I think the, you know, the one other thing I would add is that um, it's often a little surprisingly the case that people will choose um, really serious hobbies that kind of bear some resemblance to their work um, and that, you know, that offer some of the same kinds of satisfactions. And that sounds a little paradoxical, but ironically, or rather, and that it, it turns out that you know, if you are in a job doing a kind of work that you sort of, that you really enjoy, um, what you, what you may find yourself gravitating toward is a hobby that allows you to express or to experience, to use some of those, uh, some of the same abilities that you like to use on a job, um, minus the frustrations. So Winston Churchill is a great example. He was a painter and he, he, he talked about painting as great because for him it was like politics. Right? You needed a clear vision of where you're going to go. Um, once you started work on something, you had to commit to it. But he didn't have the Labor Party standing over shoulder saying, that cow is too big and the sky is the wrong shade of blue. So it was the rewards of political life without the downsides. And one of the things you see over and over again is people choosing hobbies that allow them to express or to use some of the same kinds of abilities that they do on that, that they uh, that they use in their work, um, but at a different time scale, maybe with faster rewards, or being able to use them in situations like you know games, for example where the rewards come faster and the outcomes are a lot clearer than in their professional lives. So if it turns out that you find something that you know, feels a little bit like your work, but in a good way, that's actually a perfectly fine thing. So um, you're, if anybody's listening and they're, they're wanting more information, um, your book is full of way more than, than what we've talked about here. So how can they get a hold of your book or you if they, they need more? Sure. Well, you know, the book is, uh, you know, sort of available in bookstores near you or, or, or online. Um, but I also, if, if they want to read more, they also um, can visit uh, the Deliberate Rest blog, uh, and the URL there is www.deliberate.rest. Rest Rest is actually a top-level domain now. Um, And that brings the story of Rest up to date. Um, I talk about new research in brain science and psychology and new case studies and um, things that, you know, examples of companies today that are applying deliberate rest in their workplaces, doing things like, you know, sort of having, uh, installing nap pods or nap rooms or even shortening the work day in an effort to encourage people to focus more, but also to have more free time. Well, that's great. I, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I think this was a really important talk, topic for us to talk about, um, just because it, it's affecting everybody on, on some level. So thank you so much for joining me. No, oh, thank you, Rebecca. It's a real pleasure. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week.